Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, na, na, na. Our bears born room. They're the ones that fight for truth. Bears are alive or a hundred proof. Even if the bears win or lose. A bears born room. They're the ones that fight for truth. Bears are alive or a hundred proof. No matter if the bears win or lose. Eagles by eight. Pretty. Lines them up. He's back again. He steps up. He's hit. He stumbles. He is throwing it deep for the end zone. And it is batted around and incomplete. And the game is over. The game is over. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Let the celebration begin. Butterflies appreciated worldwide Canada, Scotland, England, Brazil, Mexico, and Dubai Dr. Phil is the guy The one to realize That the bar room needed to show With an endless shoot supply Go big coat for the narrative On color brought the Jaces of Gabe From Mitchell, now I'm the Ashok Hey man, if this is a dream Don't wake me up The Eagles have won the Super Bowl Oh my goodness 41 to 33 And Mike I'm going to give you my MVP, Nick Foles. No question about it. Bears born room, they're the ones that fight for truth. Bears are alive or a hundred proof, even if the Bears win or lose. You know, that locker room is a special locker room, and you can see it throughout the course of this game. No matter what happened, we just kept sticking together, kept leaning on each other. We have an amazing coaching staff, amazing personnel staff. I mean, just to... Uh, be in this moment, I mean, unbelievable. Even if the Bears win or lose, no MC for the Bears on room. They're the ones that fight for truth. Bears are alive or a hundred proof. No matter if the Bears win or lose. They made a lot of good plays today. And uh, we battled, it was competitive, but we just obviously didn't get the job done. You got a Bears feel. We weren't able to, to perform at our best. Um, obviously, didn't do a good enough job coaching. Missed a lot of opportunities offensively in the first half. Um, didn't play good enough defense. Didn't play good enough in a kicking game. Just, uh, just wasn't, just wasn't quite enough against a good team like, like Philadelphia. And um, give them credit. Uh, Coach Peterson, his staff did, a, did an outstanding job. It's a great, highly competitive game, uh, but in the end, we just couldn't, just couldn't quite make enough plays. It's the Bears bomb, and of course, it's only one Bears, the smartest man. Hey, are you all ready to get this started? Going live. Listener discretion is advised. Keep your head out there, they're going to do dumb, play our game. All right, play, play hard, but stay poised. Got three, going to be savage. Two, grab your shit. One, do it. Let's be great. Let's be great. Hello, Bears fans. This is the Super Bowl edition of Bears Hour Live with the one and only Draft Dr. Phil. And tonight, we are R-rated. You just heard Super Bowl winning quarterback Nick Foles losing quarterback Tom Brady, and Mr. Personality himself, Bill Belichick, after last night's 41-33 to Eagles Super Bowl win. My name is Bears Girl, and I'm filling in for Aldo Gandia. I know everyone in the ballroom can't wait to hear from Shane, the smartest man, on his first-hand experience in the Eagles' nest, as he rooted for the Patriots last night. He will join us shortly. But first, we begin with Draft Dr. Phil's opening thoughts on Super Bowl 52. So the barroom was divided last night, and you and I both picked the Eagles to win. Give Barflies your first thought on the game. Well, anyone watching the game recognized the firepower on both sides of the football. Uh, excuse me, on both sides, uh, the Eagles and the the New England Patriots were just blowing up the statistical scoreboard, so to speak, as well as the end zone 
scoreboard and it just made for a feel that this was going to come down to who had the ball last and to really you know watch how the Philadelphia Eagles were going to attack them and to see it play itself out uh, it just reflected back to me throughout the last few years under John Fox, just not being aggressive, BG, just being conservative, no matter their record or situation, the roll of the dice that separates men from boys happens to coaches and coaching. And if you're going up against the best, the guys that wear the belt, the guys that are just written in in preseason that they're going to be in the playoffs that they're going to make it to the Super Bowl those guys those teams that are as dominant as they are can't be overlooked you have to throw every punch you have in your playbook and and be in situations where you're going to have to take risks and you know planned risks those are the ones that you prepare your whole life to take on the greatest of stages. And really, the game came down to Peterson believing in his quarterback that he is going to make the big plays. There's so many reflections to the Bears. Obviously, Alshon Jeffrey, get this out of the way because I know I differ than from Shane. I You listen to the show. Bar flies, no. New listeners, I was very adamant. Tag get what you can if it's a trade or out of the player fans that say and i'm talking about alshon jeffrey you don't let homegrown talent walk you gotta learn from that mistake now with kyle fuller and it was just reflecting back to the bears throughout the games and 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 where nagy's going to come and now alshon's gone and who's going to replace who who are we going to get that are going to high point and help the quarterback out like you saw on this, the grandest of stages? We all grow up to get to the Super Bowl and get to that point. You've been a fan of the Bears forever, and now there's a change of direction. The whole weekend kicked off with Erlacher going in and, and talking about that, and then the Super Bowl culminated it with the reflection to the Bears, and, and that is Doug Peterson that is reflecting towards Matt Nagy and what he's going to bring, that risk-taking, creative philosophy that's going to fit what the Bears are going to be in the future. And if you saw the Eagles, that's the family tree. That's the coaching family tree, and, and that really stood out. And then as far as the game is concerned, I want to get one thing off my chest that's it's bothering you know officials and patriots and all of this uh, you watch this game and there's no doubt everybody in football world is saying well the eagles scored too quickly because they left a lot of time on the board for this guy you can't have it both ways national media and i'm going to specifically point out mike wilbaum and stephen a smith two terrible takes and, and really take a freaking look in the mirror first of all tom brady is the greatest of all time he threw for 500 and something yards in the game 505 battled his ass off to help this fucking team get to where they are in the class that they were put in the Ter- terrible job play by play by Chris Collinsworth and Al Michaels couldn't take away from what was being shown at quarterback out there. Now, Nick Foles played tremendous, but I think anybody criticizing Tom Brady today has no idea about football. Tom Brady's 40 years old, right? And that in and above itself is amazing. But don't go on any radio show or newspaper 
questioning that man at all. Everything he possibly could do, he tried to do and left on that fucking field. And those people taking shots about, oh, great, as he dropped the ball again. And, and comparing he's not the greatest athlete, to that settles it now. Michael Jordan, let me see Jordan get under center and take a goddamn snap and read defense and go through what it is and take a shot to the mouth. It's two different sports. Will Bond and Stephen A. taking the shot, a comparison of Jordan to Brady, the greatest of all time. At quarterback, which is the most difficult position in football. No one's questioning whether Tom could go up and dunk a fucking football. I mean, a basketball. Like, that is the most dumb comment. It bothered me so much with the Wilbon tweet. I, Shane would probably remember what the hell it was. It started there. Take a, a sack fumble. Like, he's not an athlete. Like, that doesn't happen to every quarterback that's ever played football gets strip-sacked. It's not... It's part of the game of football, for God's sake. We're going to beat up Tom Brady. It just got under my skin because you took away from the game. You know, the Malcolm Butler stuff and and all the halftime show and the criticism of that, and it, it just... It totally, the fact that Brady lost the game and the evil empire died, I get it. I get it. And I, the chaos in Philly, we're going to get into. But the fact of the matter is, I just didn't want people to just overlook what Tom Brady did out there. That was absolutely amazing. Yeah, he missed a couple passes. That happens. But if he's throwing dying balls out there, Moving this offense, playing a, a, t- a defense, mind you, that made Minnesota look like they were going to be the first team in the XFL. That defense that Philly has was as advertised. That's why I picked them to win. And Tom Brady's out there dueling, coming down to the final play, which, mind you, was wrongly officiated. Let me get this out there, too, before last play. I'm getting all... These are the things that bother me. Throws it into the end zone. Fans, I'm sorry, are so ignorant to the truth of football. Okay, Rob Gronkowski pushes off, too, so it's going to be interference on him. And yes, you're right. The guy was chucked 27 yards downfield, smashed like he's on punt return. Like, I'm blocking him when the ball's in. It's a penalty. It's got to be called. You don't officiate different. You, rule is the rule. And it pisses me off that the NFL, I don't know what a touchdown is. I know that's a penalty, but they didn't call it. Oh, but they're both penalties, right? Guys, Shane, Phil, they're both penalties. No. They offset. Right? Say they offset. What happens, PG? They replay the down. It's about getting the opportunity to do it again. To end the game correctly and fairly. So don't say it can't because we've been burned many a time on the last second Hail Mary as well as one on some. So the chance to put a finale, the curtain down, disappointed me that it ended with a clear-cut penalty, clear-cut offsetting if you want, but another time untimed down to end the game would have been fair for me. I am a, you know, a, a OCD when it comes to refereeing and ending games correctly. It's the biggest game, these errors. If that was a Chicago Bear in the Clement catch, if that was Tariq Cohen with that little tiny move, no, incomplete. Don't say no, Phil. You're biased, Phil. No. <laughs> I've lived it. I can't believe I don't know what a touchdown is. That Tariq Cohen is incomplete. Bears don't score. Clement does score. So there's inconsistency that's ruining 
what could have been one of the greatest games ever. But it leaves a sour taste in my mouth, BG. Those things really bothered me that I had to get off in my opening rant. Well, for Barflies just listening, I need to let them know that tonight's show is R-rated, if you haven't already figured that out, and the chat room is going crazy. And Phil, I get that it's your fucking show, but could you do us a favor and unplug your phone, because we are getting oh, horrible feedback. You should have just interrupted me. It's um, a new Have phone. you tried to interrupt yourself? Because it's not possible. Here, we love you the, anyway. Here's the trick. Yo, that always stops me. <laughs> well, I'm going to bring in somebody who has no problem interrupting you. Shane, are you still awake? Uh, I'm still here. I'm still recovering from last night. But yeah. So, <laughs> tell us about your time in the Eagles Nest. I didn't. I, I don't know. Was there a big game last night or something? <laughs> I just stayed home, caught up on the DVR. I don't know if there was a big game last night. I'm not sure. So let's let let's let Barclays know that the four of us, so Aldo, myself, Nick, and uh, Phil, all were rooting for the Eagles, and you were the lone bar room member cheering for the Patriots. Yeah, I have a bunch of degenerate family members that are unfortunately Philadelphia Eagle fans and. You guys saw the the videos last night after the Super Bowl was over. Well, you know, probably most of my family members were involved in in all those (laughs) at at one point. You know, mother and grandmothers and aunts and uncles included. But, uh, yeah, I had to live through that. I I just under no circumstance. I'm the only Chicago Bears fan in in my family. I had to to brainwash my six-year-old son so I could at least have somebody (laughs) <laughs> on my side and when <laughs> I love my family but when they tell you that the Philadelphia Eagles fans are the worst in sports they're they're a hundred percent correct and that that includes unfortunately that includes my family I I had to show a little bit of restraint it's really hard to to watch with them and it's it's even harder because Philadelphia is a fantastic team as much as it pains me to say that you're winning a, a Super Bowl in, in dominant fashion with your backup quarterback and with a dominant attacking defense and, and you know, really killing a, a, a dynasty when it really comes down to it. And I have to be the bigger man, I guess, and kind of accept that. But, uh, yeah, I had, to, I had to take that one on the, the chin. The uh, Eagles winning the Super Bowl was worse than my uh, beloved L.A. Dodgers losing the World Series and in game seven. So that was definitely a hard one for me to take. We, we sympathize, but not yeah. really. We were, we were, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I we were you. enjoying ourselves. I can so, feel Phil, the love. <laughs> in your opening rant, you talked about Peterson taking chances in the game. And we have a clip of him sharing why he didn't want to play for that for you guys now. You know, I trust, I trust my players. I trust the coaches and, you know, I trust my instincts. I trust everything that, that I'm doing. And, um, you know, I want to maintain uh, that aggressiveness uh, with the guys. And, um, you know, in, in games like this against uh, a great opponent, um, you got to make those tough decisions that way and, and, uh, and keep yourself aggressive. Thoughts on that, guys, given that Peterson comes from the same Andy Reid coaching tree, and we know what that possibly means for the Bears with Nagy's aggressive personality. Well, absolutely. It- yeah, it's 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 certainly fun to watch. First off, I mean, you you sit back and you can't help but get excited thinking about, wow, are we really going to have something that could pen, you know potentially resemble this? We don't have the the offensive line or the offensive firepower yet to match what Philly can trot out there. But a lot of it is just a mentality coming from the head coach and. We are exactly in the wrong direction coming from John Fox and, and Dow Loggins. And when you're talking about going to uh, Doug Peterson and Frank Reich. So that part right there is, is good. But, I mean, you just talk about who, what Bears fan last night when you saw game on the line. Philadelphia has fourth and five from their own 45-yard line. They didn't even bat an eye. They're like, you know, fuck it. We're going for it. And you got to love that. And, I mean, just think about that in terms of, of being a Chicago Bears fan where 
you know, we have a fourth and one play and we're relying on Mike Burton to make a play for us. You know, it's just, <laughs> they're, they're, they're putting all their chips in the middle of the table. And they said, Nick Foles, you've, you know, you've been playing fantastic. Go out there and, and make a play for us. And, and he did time after time after time. And Bears fans should be excited about that. Just, just watching how things unfold. I mean, Matt Nagy and his introductory presser said it as much. He's going to be an aggressive play caller. The thing with that is, you ha- if you're going to be aggressive, you have to pick your spots, but you always have to be true to that form. And Doug Peterson mentioned it at, in the, the postgame pressers that he hopes winning the Super Bowl does not change that for him. And hopefully, you know, Nagy has, has taken a lot of notes over the years because he's directly worked with Doug Peterson and Andy Reid since 2008. So when you're talking about him being, you know, a direct descendant, he's he's been with these guys the the past 10 years and and there's a lot to to get fired up about with him taking over the reins here in Chicago and I, I think Phil would totally agree with me. Oh, absolutely because you know what it is, it's it's a mentality that the head coach believes in you. And it took Fox a f- three years to give an honest answer. And I talked about it the, in on uh, the special with Erlager. I just mentioned it, how important it is that the head coach be honest because the players in the locker room see that. You know, what that young man, Butler, is going through and finding out before the, and, and that whole drama that's going to transpire, kid can't play there. I, I don't know how they'll match that, patch that up because that's you work your whole life to get to a point, and you get there and you're benched five minutes before the game. I, I'm just looking at it how being honest to your press conference, to your fan base, and to your football team. You know, that kind of integrity makes play coaches believe in their team and the team, most importantly, believe in their head coach. And if my head coach is saying, no, we're going for it, fourth and five game, this is what you dream about. And, and having that quarterback's mentality, there's something to be said about it. It really is, you know, and you look at, where Nagy had to come from, arena football, not drafted, not thought of, even though he busted his butt, he dreamed of getting the opportunity to be give practice reps, and then all of a sudden they make a rule with your name in it. I don't know if many people know that, but there's a Matt Nagy rule that means anyone coaching on the on your staff can never dress and then become a hidden player of any kind it's called the nagy rule and it is in the nfl handbook which is interesting because he's a backup kid with that fire and that presence and he talked like shane said you see the tree but you also see what peterson was a backup quarterback that when he got in there was a competitor and would win games that mentality i think the aggressiveness and the belief in telling your players the truth. I think the excitement you saw Nagy being the Chicago Bears head coach, but asking a question, who's going to call plays? Oh, I will. You know, we're going to have fun. We're going to be creative. Those things resonate, echo off the Hallis Hall grounds into the locker room and makes players excited. And when you look at, at the Super Bowl and having belief in your players, what that could do for your your team, because they were eight and eight. Think about it. They weren't in the playoffs. This stuff is written time and time again. You can turn this around. And I always say this to people. <laughs> you know, and I got into it with with blogger nerds. Those fucks don't know a damn thing when anyone is telling you coaching on any level of football isn't as important as talent, then they've lost you in conversation. 
I'm not going to try to talk to somebody who's a mechanic about fixing a goddamn car. Because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I would have to study and learn it. And then if I did learn it and I never was a mechanic and I have that big mouth and I'm going to tell you what you should do but I never done it, that bothers me too. When you see people saying these things of coaching, you saw it take place how this guy's turned it around and how they go in with Shane said, dominate and take down a giant. It was portrayed as Davy versus Goliath, but the Eagles, I picked not because I was not wanting the Patriots to win, to be clear. I just thought that defense and their explosive offense and play caller is going to propel them to be in the game, and I'm going to pick on the guy that's never won. And that's how I saw that game playing out, and that's how it ended. And that's how they won, because of the coach and his players believing in the plan and him believing in them. I know it's a redundant record, but it's one that I think you're getting here in Chicago, like Shane said, with Nagy. I I already feel it. There was a different vibe with Pace. There was a different vibe with Nagy. Hey, Phil, real quick before before BG takes over and moves (laughs) on to the next segment. But... uh, Something that I think needs to be talked about, and we chatted a little bit about it um, on Twitter today in our DM. When you're talking about being aggressive on the offensive side of the ball, Philadelphia is just as aggressive on the other side of the ball, too. Mm-hmm. And that that matters. You know, you're, you're, the, the defense, when they're sitting on the sidelines, sees how aggressive the offense is. That gets these guys up. It gets them hyped. It gets them excited. These are young guys. You know, it's not a bunch of old men out there. These are young kids that that feed off of that energy. And then the defense goes out there, and it's the same type of deal for the offense while they're watching. And that is, you know, I, I everybody's happy that Fangio came back. And, and yes, we don't have the horses that, that Philly has on defense, but I think it's relevant in the situation I mean, the same type of deal. You saw the Patriots go for it on fourth and five. And what did Jim Schwartz do? Jim Schwartz said, we're fucking coming. We're going after Brady. It's fourth and five. We're not going to sit back and and -hmm. let him try to pick us apart. Yes, they gave up a ton of yardage. But still, it matters that you keep that, you know, pit bull mentality that you're just not going to give up. And and it, it, it paid off for him. You saw Brandon Graham make the biggest play of the game because they have that relent relentlessness. Um, with their you know defensive line, and that is my one fear with Fangio a little bit moving forward is, and we've talked about it before on Hundred Proof, is the lack of aggression. You know, last night if Fangio was in that situation on fourth and five, do you think he's bringing the horses after after Brady on fourth and five? I think it's a legitimate question, and I I, I can't say that he would. I don't know if he's I don't know if he's built if he's built that way, but. I don't know. Does, what do you think? Does Fox and the cloud of his conservativeness, right. you know, kind of smudge up who Fangio is? So can it, we, can, if we see aggressive, Shane, yeah, then we know, and and we're gonna exactly talk, we're gonna document this. But what Shane is saying is right. You saw those bracket coverage; they go into cloud coverage or cover four. And, and they're allowing the underneath, and they're going to rally and tackle and, and give up the first down. They're just worried about the time. And being conservative in those situations, even though you're giving up yards, as Shane said, those body blows take their toll on a quarterback. Keep getting them. Keep hitting them. Play to the whistle, but play to the echo, I would tell my players. Send them a message, and you're going to be there all day. Just get him down on the ground. Because you get tired of getting up and taking shots. And and it does send a message. It really does. And I think you're 100% especially, right. Especially when you're 40 years old. I'm 41. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I don't recover like I could when I was 23, 24 years old. I mean, that's, that's not breaking news. But I think it is a legitimate concern. And, Phil, we've, we've watched enough tape and, and watched just you know, enough games in general even when Fangio was back in San Francisco, 
he was never overly aggressive. Mm-hmm. He disgu- he disguises his fronts, but he's he's pretty much just playing straight up. You'll see the occasional stunt and he things loves like that. A nickel yeah. coming off the edge. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He loves to bring Bryce Callahan. I mean, hey, how Bryce. many times? How many times do we? Bryce. Yeah, how many times do we see that? The, the smallest defender on the field, and here he is coming chopping down Ben Roethlisberger. You know, <laughs> Bryce. And, send yeah. Bryce. Send McKinnon. But it is going to be McManus rather McManus. I, I really do think this is going to be something worth watching because Ryan Pace showed you his aggressiveness this past off season. And well, they were yes. aggressive with the quarterback. They're aggressive with the coach. Yep. And M- Matt Nagy's coming in here and, and saying up front that he's going to show, you know, he's going to be an aggressive play caller. And the, to me, it's going to be fascinating to watch if, if there's going to be a lack of aggression on the defense at times, how that's going to correlate with, with Ryan Pace and with Matt Nagy moving forward. Because I said, you you can't watch a Philadelphia Eagles game, and it's it's almost hard to breathe when you're focused on it because they're, they're, they're coming every single down. They're attacking on offense every single down. And that's the way that you have to play the game in 2018. Unfortunately, the Bears are still stuck in the 70s, what we've been used to, you know, these last few years. But... Uh, We've all said how you know how much things are changing in in Chicago, and hopefully this is the year. This is the off season. We'll bring in some more horses that we get to see it actually play out on the field. All right, guys, the chat room is lit up. We've got Bob Phelan in the house, who says that Pedersen's calls won the game because he showed players that he believes in them, and at the same time, Brady's performance was very un Brady like. He should and always does win games like that. So my question to you both <laughs> is how much longer do you think the Pats will reign supreme in the AFC? Well, I speak first because shit. <laughs> um, I think the New England Patriots are at a crossroads here. It all is based on body language, verbiage, and what transpired with Malcolm Butler. Because I, I just don't know. I know the rumors came out. Possibly could be the last game. You also throw in the little nugget with Josh McDaniels being coy with the Colts. And word is leaking out that he's going to stay with the Patriots. That's like, you know, Godfather turning over the mob to, you know, his son type stuff going on. It's like, no, McDaniels is setting up to be the next head coach of the Patriots. You keep that kind of continuity and that kind of flow, you know. I didn't see age in Tom Brady. In fact, I if they have Gronk caught that ball, are we talking about <laughs> hammering home what the greatest this guy is? It's unbelievable. It didn't happen, yes, but didn't take away from what he did in that game. I don't see him. I, I just see this guy as the top top three in the game every year and and this year was no different i mean teams in the nfl looking for quarterbacks honestly it's it's not the uh national narrative of brady but teams would freaking fight to get him to come play for them because of how good he plays and distributes the football it's unbelievable and then even in the last night where he's as old as he is and taking the beating that he did he escaped the pocket at the end of the game should have been sacked got away from Graham and then was able to get the ball down the football I mean I don't know what else he could have done you can't control a strip sack so I just think barring the the leaving of a Gronk retirement and all that stuff they're the best team in the AFC and I don't see that change in next year on my end. Shane? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Phil wholeheartedly. And it's um, actually got to be completely honest. We got to spit the truth on the show. I stepped out and didn't hear a fucking word he said since this is an R rated <laughs> show. <laughs> so just like every other show? Yeah, pretty much. I had, had, had to take a little bathroom break there. But uh, yeah. No, what was the question real quick, and I'll rehash what you're saying. I'm sorry. 
Will the Patriots continue to be the reigning AFC team or the best team in the AFC? Uh, who that's going to be, that's going to be real fun to watch. I know a lot of people keep on floating out there that, that they think that Tom Brady's going to retire. I, everybody's hearing about this TB 12 and, and his kind of his, his business away from football. And to me, I think the longer he plays, the more that makes that business viable, Mm -hmm. especially if he's playing well. So I think there's a lot of that involved really to me. I think if there's any animosity and if there's anything going to happen, and I heard a couple other people say this on some different shows, that it's going to come down to Belichick. Because it, to me, it just seems like there's something different there. You know, it, it's I don't think Tom Brady's going anywhere. Obviously, Robert Kraft isn't going anywhere. But part of me thinks that Belichick had in his mind that Part of his career that he wanted to cap off is, all right, with Tom getting older, I can do this without Tom. I'm going to take Jimmy Garoppolo, mm-hmm. and I'm going to try to make that run. I'm going to you know, try to cement myself in history you know, even more so without Tom Brady being the guy. And I think, I don't know if it, I don't want to say it was really a wake-up call, but I think maybe that that's where all of this uh, supposed tension is coming from. But when you know you look at the you look at the AFC, and I'm sure Phil touched this on, touched on this when he answered it. Tom Brady threw for over 500 yards last night. He threw for three touchdowns. He didn't have any interceptions. You know that 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 fumble's not his fault. I mean, how how can you? There's if, if anybody's putting this on Tom Brady, it's just it's you're not a football fan. You have no idea about football. It's it's ridiculous, but um, I if they bring the whole crew back, I mean, I think that they're going to have to focus long and hard on improving the defense. But you know, there, there's just as many questions around Pittsburgh. There's just as many uh, mm-hmm. questions around you know the, the whoever Jaguars. The, the Jaguars. Yeah, who's going to be their quarterback? And if you bring back that the whole Chiefs. crew. And let's be let's be honest. The New England Patriots easily could have won that game last night when it comes down mm-hmm. to it. I mean, he doesn't fumble the ball. Was there anybody here saying, "Oh, Philly's going to stop him here"? <laughs> you know, <that laughs> exactly. Everybody on the planet was expecting Tom to march him down the field and punch it in. To me, I think the the complexion of the overall game, in my eyes, as much as I wanted to see Philly lose, was when Brady dropped that pass. To me, that was a, a humongous statement if he would have caught that it just to me it would have really ignited everybody and I mean I know that sounds foolish because their offense was on fire but um, I thought that that was a huge momentum shift I mean he was wide open and I'm sure he would have got out of bounds rather quickly but still you you see a 40 year old quarterback going downfield and and (laughs) making a catch like that that's going to rally the troops but uh if they're all if they're all back, I don't think New England's going anywhere anytime soon. And I mean, if they if they go out and go eleven and five next year, people are going to say, "See, yep, yeah, they're the Patriots are done." <laughs> exactly. Well, eleven and five, you know, that's <laughs> that's ridiculous. So remember when we going. were eleven? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think they're going any anywhere anytime soon. All right, guys, I want to switch gears and ask you if you think the Bears should fear an Eagles dynasty. Oh, God. I, I don't see it. If there's going to be an Eagles dynasty? I mean, I, God, you you really want to ruin my night two nights in a row, BG? About I'm, going for the, I'm going for the whole week, Shane. The whole yeah, week. thanks. Well, <laughs> I, I mean, I'll jump in here. It's Honestly, F- Philadelphia is, is stacked, and you've everybody's heard my rants on Philly before. There's going to be a team out there that's going to overpay for Nick Foles. It happens with Philadelphia almost, you know, in a three-year cycle that somebody over, you know, Miami overpays for A.J. Feely. Washington overpays <laughs> for, for Donovan McNabb. Uh, Arizona overpays for Kevin Cobb. Then they go Cobb, out and they, that was they, his name. Yeah, they get a first-rounder for Sam frigging Bradford. And now they're going to flip Nick Foles for a pr- probably a, a, a premium pick. Now, to me, there's a lot of system involved 
in Philadelphia. And Phil alluded to this, you know, being aggressive, having the aggressive coach, being surrounded by quarterback-centric coaches. You know, you, you saw this played out with Nick, Nick Foles in Philadelphia on his first stint. You, you send him to St. Louis where he's surrounded by um, Mr. 8-8. Eight eight, um, his name is escaping Jeff, Jeff Fisher. Jeff Fisher. He, he's not getting that constant um, coaching that all quarterbacks need. So he's, he's not going to be the same player now. Is a team like Arizona going to uh, step up and offer their first-round draft pick for Nick Foles in, in Philadelphia's yes. world? They probably – Phil's right. They probably will. But Philadelphia is a, a very young team. I mean, they got a they got a top fifteen talent that they drafted this year in the second round. That's going to be added to this defense and be healthy next year. And Sidney Jones, you remember that guy? Mm-hmm. He didn't play this year because he tore his Achilles. You know uh, <laughs> what's going to happen with Jason Peters? He's he's a Hall of Fame level offensive tackle, and they they're defensive line is ridiculous. Fletcher Cox is under a long-term contract. Uh, Vinnie Curry is under a long-term deal. Uh, Timmy Jernigan just signed an extension. Brandon Graham is under a, a long-term deal. Uh, you know, they're, they're secondary. They, they pull off a trade for Ronald Darby. Their safeties, Malcolm Jenkins, is, is a little bit older, but he's, he's a key cog to that entire defense. But a, a lot of it is going to come down, and let's get this out of the way. Anybody that, that anybody that says that Carson Wentz should be traded because of what <laughs> Nick Foles did, just stop watching football. Don't listen to the show because I, I don't want to have <laughs> anything to do with you. It's it's foolishness. Carson Wentz is going to be the quarterback if Carson Wentz is healthy, and Carson Wentz should be. You're not investing all of that draft capital and making two moves up to number two overall to get him. He's going to be the quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles, and I'm not going to say they're going to be a dynasty. I don't think they're going to be a dynasty, but I think they're going to be contending to uh, possibly be in the Super Bowl for Mm -hmm. quite a while to come. All right. Well, it wouldn't be a Super Bowl Bears Hour Live without some music. So let's take a quick halftime show and listen to some Timberlake. Them other girls in your heart I think it's special what's behind your back. So turn around and I pick up the slack. Dirty boy. All right, Phil, you're a football analyst, a former player, a former scout and coach. You're an artist. You're a singer. Tell us what you thought about Timberlake's halftime show performance, because I absolutely hated it. So many people are are talking about this on different ends of the aisle. Honestly, I just, I had a hard time hearing the performance. I appreciate Justin Timberlake as a talent, but I just couldn't hear it to tell you, honestly, my own opinion of it i can admit without you know getting ruffled feathers or anything about i'm a fan of jt i think he can do it all and i love his music but i just honestly thought whoever staged this just did it like they were in a studio like going into the crowd and all that stuff just wasn't feeling it, BG. So I'm more leaning on your side. I was kind of disappointed that it wasn't done to the level I know he can bring it. He's an entertainer. And I think they brought out the Soldier Field sod. (laughs) 
slipped. <laughs> he totally slipped on it. And that's what I think happened. <laughs> Shane, did you get to watch it, or were you wallowing in the corner? Uh, no, I, I. It was on. I'm not a. I, I will watch it in passing. Usually, my uh, Super Bowl pattern at halftime seems to be all the the ladies that are part of the party seem to move up to the front of the room, closer to the TV, <laughs> and the, the men gravitate towards the food and take their bathroom breaks and fill their drinks back up. But I, I, I gotta agree with you guys. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know if I would quantify myself as a, a huge Timberlake fan, but, um, it just, it, to me, it didn't have the Super Bowl halftime vibe to it. Right. As, as it, you know, it, it just didn't feel like that. And I saw some videos of fans that were in the seats in the stadium and it just looked like he was smushed up in a little corner and they had the fake fans there jumping around the stage and it you could barely hear it from their from their vantage point and it just i don't know it it to me it didn't have the feel of you know a true super bowl halftime show uh you know lady gaga a couple of years ago it just you you watch that and in to me, it felt more like the Super Bowl. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody brought up Michael Jackson. I think it was back in the early 90s, like 92 or 93. Jackson, uh, they, Prince. Yeah, they, they replayed that. Yeah, Prince in the, in the Bears. Bruno Mars. Bowl. Yeah, Bruno Mars was another one, yeah. But, uh, you know, Prince was the – I was more on edge for that one because the Bears were playing in the Super Bowl that right, year. Right. And the weather sucked and – but uh, going back and, and kind of watching bits and piece of it, pieces of it since then, it uh, you know he really stepped up in, in true Prince fashion. But last night, I wasn't impressed with it at all. But like I said, I might have been a little bit jaded because I was just worried that Philly was going to win <laughs> more than anything. So, but uh, yeah, well, overall, I was disappointed. I feel bad for all of the fake football fans who just tuned in for the halftime show because that was a complete letdown. And I want to tease 100 Proof later this week, which is actually going to be available as a podcast on Thursday morning. Uh, that Aldo has a Timberlake story that he's going to share on 100 Proof. So you guys want to tune in for that. Sexy back. I'm assuming it's sexy back. <laughs> he will, yes. Aldo has a sexy back. Timberlake was actually Timberlake was actually his masseuse. That's the masseuse story. It's See, I out. thought it was a waxing story. Maybe we got our we got our stories crossed here. Maybe there's two stories. Was it the All one right. where the wax pulled off by the, the Asian woman and he yells Justin Timberlake? Oh, okay, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So I want to um, bring up a bar fly. Frankie Myers is oh. on the chat. He is not in the house, unfortunately. He can't connect with us. But he's got a question for you, Shane. How yes. much crow are you eating? Oh, my uh, God. Quote, I don't <laughs> want Brad Childress anywhere near the Bears in 2018. Well, let, let's Clear let's it just, up. Let's Clear just get this, this out there, Mr. Myers. I <laughs> made that. do that. Before is, we do that, we have some Frankie, audio. <laughs> how is Frankie being unmagoo like? Magoo stepped in. I, I'm disappointed in Myers not standing up to Shano. No, he's got audio. He's got audio uh, oh. issues. He, uh, oh, he can't okay. connect into Skype, but uh, he's definitely in the chat room <laughs> wanting to take Shane on. Is he on Nicky's iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> all right guys <laughs> so we've got audio um where um brad childress was giving an interview to molly and hanley on the score 670 radio the day after Nagy was announced as our new head coach can we talk you out of retirement brad wouldn't it be nice for you to work for the hometown team is that uh humanly possible yeah owen crute said uh, owen crute said he would get in a car and drive to your house and say how retired are you brad what will it take <laughs> yeah you never know i never say never right does it mean anything to you to to be you know maybe back in the hometown to see 
one of your protégés in the hometown. Uh, it absolutely does. Uh, I was lucky enough to to where my dad took me to Wrigley Field and watched the Bears play. I was there the day that Gail Sayers was taken off on an infamous picture on that stretcher oh. that never, you never see anymore. Um, I watched that happen from uh, the upper deck down the third baseline. Um, so, yeah, I've always been a Bears fan. Uh, that may have been one of the tougher things uh, in going to the Minnesota Vikings. You know, you, you're a Bears fan. You know all about the Chicago Bears, Chicago <laughs> people, Chicago's uh, passion for sports, and especially their football team. So, yeah, it, it's huge. I'll, and I'll, I'll watch that from afar. That'll be, uh, uh, that'll be really satisfying to watch him have success. So the announcement came out today that he is unretiring and he is heading to Chicago to join the Bears and Nagy as a special assistant offensive consultant. Shane, why don't you answer Frankie's challenge? Okay, before I bury Frankie, <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw out a little nugget out there. Uh, if you go back to the, I believe it was the day, or it was either the day that Nagy was announced or the day after, um, Brad Childress had an interview on uh, with David Kaplan, and at the end, maybe Aldo can or Nikki can find the the audio of that. At the end of the interview, they actually talk about him joining Matt Nagy's staff. And Brad Childress pretty much alludes to it way back then. Nobody really picked up on it too much. He said, well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Anything like that, I'll wait and, I'll wait and let Nagy announce whatever's going to be happening in terms of me potentially being on his staff. So I think this has been in play for quite a while, you know, in, in him, him having a role. But, but getting back to Frankie, and I know we had some back and forth there. And I saw Frankie's comment there, if I'm eating crow. I'm really not eating crow. Frank, Frankie wanted Brad Childress as the head coach of the Chicago Bears. Let's throw that out there. <laughs> well, that that's was... the truth. You're not throwing it out there. I right. Admit. <laughs> head coach Brad Childress, no. Him, uh, offensive, you know, assistant where they can, Matt Nagy can, you know, use him as, uh, you know, <laughs> sounding board. Yes, yeah, sounding board. Bounce things off him. Absolutely, I have no no problem with that. Brad Childress, the head coach. Phil, I think you're probably going to agree with me here. I have no. Ryan Pace is is smarter than that. I would hope to not tie his future to a head coach. You know, in Brad Childress that had a couple of good years with with Brett Favre in, in Minnesota, but he he's. He's the perfect complement to a guy like Nagy that's young and up and coming and, you know, kind of green around the ears because he's been there. He's done that. He's been around. And I mean, all of Brad Childress's, most of his success has been as an assistant under Andy Reid. And he's like Phil said, he's the perfect sounding board for Nagy to, to go back and say, you know, what do you think about this, Brad? And well, you know, I really wouldn't attack this that way. And it's just another guy, for, like, you know, you talk about Doug Peterson. It's the same type of guy that you can go and it's, uh, he's, he's quarterback centric, you know, offensive centric. And he talks about not handling the quarterbacks with, with kid gloves, but, um, He's, you know, he always says you don't have to, you know, MF him all the time because he thinks that that's important to him. You know, if you're upset with him, you don't have to talk down to him because he's the, you know, they're the leader of the team. And I also think that that's important. But in terms of bringing him in and in the role that they're giving him as a consultant, I, I'll, I'll agree with Frankie there. Absolutely. Just the, the information alone is an absolute win for this franchise. I mean, we're talking about coming from Dowell Loggins and, and Dave Ragone and that's it really as our offensive sounding boards on this team. And now you're talking <laughs> about Matt Nagy and talking about Brad Childress and, and uh, Mark, Mark Helfrich. Helfrich. Yeah. And these guys that have, you know, heavily invested in RPOs and, and really know how to, to run a legitimate pro off, pro um, offense and I think it's this is all about one guy it's about number 10 and right. Childress has been around stable quarterbacks his entire career for the most part 
just like Andy Reid has, just like Matt Nagy has. And uh, I think he's he's going to be bringing all of that knowledge and wisdom to Chicago. Just as not just not as head coach. Thank God. Some, some people are meant to be coordinators or better positional coaches. And when you have a young head coach, I mean, you got the uh, Will Furry, the wide receiver coach, former head coach. You have this mix, this cornucopia of coaches that have different. Black backgrounds and philosophies, but one thing that Shane's talking about is they all uniformly have quarterback coaching experience, and that room becomes that much more important. And because I mean, I laughed when Shane said because you got Dave Ragone and Dal Loggins, and and that was your sounding board on offense. You'll keep a conservative guy, even so. On top of the conservativeness. Of a head coach, you got an offensive coordinator that didn't have feel and didn't have a strong sense of confidence and belief. And that echoed through that the football team. I mean, I, I couldn't be more boisterous about it throughout the whole history of the show, how awful it was for me to watch it. Now you bring in a Childress who understands West Coast philosophy, understands shotgun uh, run and in zone and read and, and understands creativity and can be a presence of someone that's trusted and has been through this that maybe Mitchell can lean on Brad Childress if he's feeling confused because the old man's there. And, and that kind of personality in all of these pockets of a, of a locker room are important. Good cop, bad cop. We used to do it all the time. I used to play mental game. I would be the good cop and take care of this kid because I understood his personality. Thomas Brockett, now head coach at Anisonia High School. He's won. Well, this past year he lost in the state championship. He's won. He prior to that he won seven state championships in a row understands the importance of good cop, bad cop to communicate the process. To get the most out of a football player, you need tough love. And Brad Childress could be one of those pockets. I don't know Dave Ragone, the quarterback coach. He might be the greatest young prospect of a coach in the NFL right now. That's as much as I don't know. Because the smog of Fox was over top the conservativeness and, and the non-belief. And I think this is a home run move in my mind, because as a young head coach, I've been in that position where I've hired guys older and more experienced around me. Cause I didn't give two shits about, I got, I'm the head coach. It's my way. I cared about teaching technique and the basics and the fundamentals because all of the other X's and O's became easy once you can get to full speed and, and understand it fully. Your technique is the most important way. And someone as proficient as I know through my chain of coaching, uh, this coach is somebody that could come in here and work technique and fundamentals like nobody else in the NFL. And if you get that kind of praise and that's the mission statement for him, you've just slam dunked your young quarterback with a group of men that understand the position and he could turn to whoever he feels most comfortable with at moments and they'll get a clear cut understanding. They're all teachers and that is the difference. And that's why I feel so confident in this. And this was a great move. All right, so Frankie is really active in the chat room trying to respond to you guys, and he says he is so salty that Skype screwed me out of a good discussion with Shane. I prepped for a couple of hours after work and everything. Sad <laughs> as shit. He says, <laughs> Chili talks about how plays are not only dictated by the coaches, but also by the players. He says something along the lines of knowing what plays the player knows best and that the cute quarterback likes to run by running these types of plays and getting input from the quarterback. It increases offense productivity because you tend to get the 
most out of plays that the team and especially the quarterback are most comfortable with. Oh, without a Comments? doubt. When you get into a situation real quick, Shane, where you understand, I mean, Shane, jump in right here. Then how many times did I say you need this 29 and 24 on the field? 90% of the time, third down, you shouldn't even see Benny Cunningham's name on a football field unless you're playing Madden at Matt Balsley's house. That's the only time he should be on a third down. Tariq Cohen should be in there as much as possible. Jet sweeps, motioning, knowing what they feel comfortable in, the read option, the run pass options. You know, you look back, I just went through the whole season, and you look back every time this kid's being successful is when you're absolutely giving him a mesh point. I'm talking about Mitch Trubisky. And he's abs- allowed to throw the slant route to get him confidence up. When you do that, all of a sudden you start seeing more consistent, accurate passes down the field. Belief, knowing what they do best. Coaches that understand that can be confident because they know their guys are going to get open. And and on both sides of the football yesterday, McDaniel's side too. Don't slouch on that. They had the most yards in the history of the Super Bowl, by both teams combined, it was the most yardage the Super Bowl has ever seen because they were feeling it and feeling confident in their playmakers. I mean, the Patriots also, not to get off the subject, lost their main target and Cook, their big deep threat. If that was the Bears and we lost our number one weapon, we go down like the freaking Titanic. They're out there balling <laughs> Keep going. Let's use Gronk this way now. And and that is what is important to, you know, Chili coming in here, understanding these coaches know. They really do. You put it great, Phil. It's it to me, it's it as much info and as much knowledge as you can bring in here. I mean, the the it was never really a huge debate between Frankie and I. It was more about him being a, a viable option as head head coach. I don't right. think he, he was ever considered that for like I said to repeat myself, for him to be put in the role as, you know, uh an assistant like this, it's it's only gonna benefit the Bears. It's only gonna benefit Nagy. And you talk about a guy like Brad Childress who his, his is is familiar with a, a player like Ryan Westbrook from his Philly days and he had another uh, scat back in his days in in Minnesota that I can't remember his name, but you know, again in, in KC with how they can deploy a guy like Tyree Kill, like you're talking about, and it's <laughs> how many years, Phil, have we talked about even going way? This just a, this isn't a new issue with Chicago. Go back to 1995 when they had Raymond Harris and Rashawn Salam, and we're like, man, how can we get these guys on the field at the same time? And you know, couldn't figure it out. No, they never could. And you have Jordan Howard and, and uh, Tariq Cohen now. And like you said, third down, what down is more crucial than third down in an NFL football game? And we're pulling our most explosive athlete off the field. Like you said, for Benny Cunningham, we're involving Mike Burton on a fourth down play. <laughs> it's a, what, who's, you can't make it up. No, you can't. It's, it's like, you know, it'd be like, like me playing my six year old Madden. You're like, what the exactly. hell? You know, he's punting on second down or kicking a field goal on second down. We see we even George, saw that in Chicago. But uh, George Costanza <laughs> had yeah. offensive play. So, so there's a guy named Aldo in the uh, chat room who says Chachi won uh, was from zero. Oh, jeez. Well, we it, in my defense, he's probably hopped up on medication and not really <laughs> knowing. Which way is right? And he did get a he did get a back rub from Justin Timberlake. So, all right, guys, it is the top of the hour. I want to go to you guys both for final thoughts before we wrap up this hour. What about you, oh, BG? He's oh. gone. Uh, my Super Bowl thoughts. I don't think anybody wants to hear those. Um, I actually thought it was a really entertaining game. Um, I at, at a couple of points was uh, quite worried that uh, Shane was going to make us eat crow. Um, because it looked like the Patriots were actually going to come back, and it reminded me of the game last year where they were trailing and they did stage a comeback. 
So um, I actually enjoyed the game. It was a hell of a game for sure. And it just didn't work out the way that it should have. Bastards. You mean the way you wanted it to? No, the way it should have. Nobody <laughs> likes Philly. <laughs> All right, guys, final thoughts. Go ahead, Shane. It is your show, buddy. Go ahead. <laughs> What is this, Canada? You're all so polite all of a sudden. What the fuck? My final, my final thoughts, honestly, if you're a city that's won a Super Bowl, it's not time to destroy your city in, in, in celebrating winning a Super Bowl and a winning team from your city. The opposite should happen. You should be picking up trash off the street and giving a bum a freaking hot dog or whatever you should totally embrace yourself instead the classlessness that i'm seeing on television destroying whole you know business owner stores and people's property and machine guns are being shot off into the sky as if it's a big joke and it's sad because it's all about social media. It's all about capturing it. They're getting on top of hotels and their uh, canvas entries and, and breaking them down. I, I've seen so much. I can't believe people eat shit from a horse off the street. Guys proposing and, sh- and piss. This sounds like the end of times. So it, it's like the best of times and the worst of times and and, and i would just wish and i hope because i know i feel like there's a change there was a switch that went off that started with erlacher getting into the hall of fame that started with matt nagy being named a head coach and them doing the right thing they listened to aldo gandia's hashtag trubisky now they listened to the Godfather's hashtag of Firefox. They listened to the fulfilling lyrics of Firefox, the Christmas album. They listened to the barflies that united, the ones that stepped up and stand up for the truth. The energy, I believe in it. I feel it. I don't remember the last time I felt Okay, the draft's coming up. That's cool. But I'm really excited about the head coach and the quarterback and the fact that we have two safeties that can be superstars. I can't remember the time. I've been excited about a running back. I've been excited about great linebackers, a great D-end. Can't wait to see Julius Peppers. I can't wait to see... Roosevelt Colvin. I can't wait to see her like I felt that. I've never felt wow. This young kid, we have a young quarterback that wants to win. That's going to do anything in his power to win. That message is being sent by a coach that says I want to work with him. I'm not going to go with my boy or maybe it wasn't offered to me, but I want to work with him. I want to get over there and be the head coach. And I'm going to bring all these guys in here to help him. Shane Marsaw said, you're the quarterback. Then we had a court. You're the coach, finally. Please. You all stepped up. It happened. Now, it's the year of the turnaround. It feels different. It does. I say it with pride and passion, and it starts... Right now, free agency sets the tone of where you're going. I'm excited about what they're going to do because I don't know. I know what I would do, but I have a belief in him. I have a belief in pace. I believe that Ernie Accorsi and old money, same problems happen. They did The young man stepped up and put his neck out there and said, no, it's time to change. And that's what they did. And they got their man in. And now we're moving forward with our quarterback. And again, 
I can't remember, Shane, maybe it was Tony Parrish and Mike Brown, that I felt, wow, we got some studs in the back end that we could build around. And you're getting Demps back that could be a rotational player in case there's an injury instead of Brzezinski. That back end you feel good about. And, of course, the quarterback. And then, of course, the, you got pieces here. I don't know what Dan Durkin thinks, but I know what I think. Eddie Goldman's a superstar. I know Amos is a superstar. I know Jordan Howard is not good. He's elite. Wait do you see what I, I'm producing here. Tate don't lie. Tate don't lie. Watching that Super Bowl just made me think about the Chicago Bears, BG. And that's how I felt about it. I wanted to get the Stephen A. and the Michael Wilbaum bullshit out of the way. I'm glad I got that out of the way. And this mirror, so to speak, of what you can be is just look at the Eagles because you can be that with coaching and a belief in your players and a great hardcore spend the fucking money and shut your fucking mouths. Get talent. That's what you need to do. It is coming up, and we're going to cover it all. We're going to freaking take it to the house. There's no doubt about it. Me and Shane and Aldo and every celebrity guest that's coming up, there's going to be a lot of surprises along the way. But the Super Bowl, to me, put an end to 2017. We are now officially ready to rock and roll. All right, so we've got Chris Armstrong having a new post on BearsBarroom.com, as does Alec Lifschultz. Chris shares her opinion on possible first-round picks for the Bears, and Alec shares why the Bears need to draft a pass-rushing partner for Leonard Floyd. I want to close us out with some comments that popped up in the chat tonight. We had the Midway Sports Show join us, and they say Brady is 40 years old. He fumbled and can't catch. Wow. Unemployed John Fox says, Air Jar tried to run me over. It's okay, though, because I could use the insurance money. <laughs> Air, Jar, <laughs> Air Jar says, Timberlake was bad, and the song he covered from Prince should have been Pussy Control. Unemployed John Fox says, he wishes he had balls like the Philly coach. <laughs> and Frankie Myers, who still wants to talk to Shane, says, he loves Justin Timberlake, and Shane really is into K-pop. <laughs> what? What? What's K-pop? <laughs> what is K-pop? I think Frankie just likes Brad Childress because they have the same haircut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for another great Bears Hour Live, and we will see you all next week. Fuck Philly. <laughs> <laughs> Still not over it, eh, Shane? Fuck Philly.